Take two of the okay. Seventy dollars and eighty three cents. I think we should put it on that. When I've got the travels, I can take it a half hour. The library closes at eight, so I can't day on <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Well, all right, there you go. Thank you so much. So now you I I know that the district is and then I don't know. 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 I I I I
Senior writer and researcher, which is that's quite a great show. It's not a lot of time, so very long. I got that impression. I got that impression. I got I got that impression. I I got that impression. I got that impression. I got that Oh, it's David. <laughs>
the book and the authors and I want to also welcome we have a virtual audience joining us tonight so they are joining from afar I know that someone is watching from Michigan as well so on top of everyone in this room and they are joining us there and I want to thank you all so much for supporting Left Bank Books your support has been able to get us through the pandemic it has been able to continue bringing you incredible authors both virtually and in person Without your support, we would not be able to bring in such incredible authors as the authors that we are bringing in this evening. And now I will tell you a little bit about them. Oh, I will also mention, we are doing a lot more in-person events in April, May, and beyond. So we have a really incredible lineup and some really fantastic events that are going to be announced very soon. I know what they are, but I cannot tell you what they are. <laughs> uh, so you will have to go to our event calendar and check out. And if you aren't signed up for our email newsletter, definitely get signed up because we will want to be very quick on getting some of these tickets for some of our upcoming events. Oh, we need to Yeah. <laughs> not used to that yet. Uh, not dead yet is the mantra of the current boomer population of 73 million who still think of themselves as young. This cohort is facing challenges as they age, but are not content to throw in the towel on a full and rewarding life. The authors help, face, help readers face what's coming their way as they age with humor, optimism, energy, and honesty. Two longtime 70-something writing partners share how they and other aging boomers can navigate this new stage of their lives with optimism, energy, humor, honesty, and empathy. It's a gift to reach old age and to arrive there well and ready for more for more years. The two authors are not dead yet. Find that it's time now. <laughs> the two authors are not dead yet. Find that it's time now to tidy up their lives, to live fully in the moment with less clutter, better planning, and to free themselves to travel more, read, work, volunteer, and enjoy grown children and grandchildren. 
these later years bring challenges, but also the advantage of wisdom about their minds and bodies. Not Dead Yet is the one book that brings home all the challenges and witty, meaty chapters that provide realistic solutions through the experiences of its two female septuagenarian authors, as well as those of other women women and men of varying incomes, religions, ethnicities, and locations. From sex and dating to travel and volunteer work, writers Barbara Ballinger and Margaret Crane, who faced becoming, who faced becoming single in their last book, Suddenly Single After 50, now cope with the older decades by employing the same humor, honest storytelling, empathy, and energy. Their conclusions reflect a firm resolve that there is much life yet to be lived, giving hope, guidance, and optimism to readers. They provide an affirmation for anyone hoping to clear their hurdles and live life fully, presently, and with an eye toward fulfillment and wellness. And a quick blurb in case you weren't sold on the book yet, Susan Honeygood, the author and author and the top 50 influencer of 2021 and founder of Honeygood.com says, Barbara Ballinger and Margaret Crane provide their reader with positive and thought-provoking stories in their page turner book, Not Dead Yet. Their personal interviews with a diverse group of women in the second half of life encourage a woman to explore positive options on how to thrive, not just survive. They explore a constellation discovered in the fountain of youth. Barbara and Margaret discovered several choices on the way happiness thinks in a woman's journey over 60. And now, about our authors. Barbara Ballinger is an award-winning freelance journalist, author, and reporter who has interviewed a variety of celebrities and experts from Tipper Core to Martha Stewart, Danny Meyer, Rosalind Carter, Lorraine Bracco, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and Ruth Reichel. She has covered diverse topics from business to design, real estate, entertaining, food, law, and personal finance. Her work has appeared in publications such as the Chicago Tribune, New York Times, Crane's Chicago Business, HGTV, HGTV American Bar Association Journal, How, House Beautiful, Multifamily Executive, Developer, Realtor, Rob Report, St. Louis Post Dispatch, Travel and Leisure, and more. <laughs> that was a lot. Uh, of the 19 books she has co authored, or she has authored, 10 of which have been with Margaret Crane. The first was Corporate Bu Bloodlines. The Future of the Family Firm, and most recent, Suddenly Single After 50 and the Kitchen Bible. And Margaret Crane is a nationally known freelance writer focusing on business, food, wine, fashion, home furnishings, and real estate. She has interviewed such luminaries as Jack Buck, Virginia, Virginia Johnson, Sally Quinn, Moshe Dan, uh, Shimon Pears, Dr. Benjamin Spock, and many others. <laughs> Uh, her work has appeared in a wide variety of publications, including Beverage Journals, Crane Chicago Business, uh, St. Louis Business Journal, St. Louis Post Dispatch, St. Louis Magazine, St. Louis Town Style, and more. A proven writer with 10 titles to her credit, Mar Margaret's latest book of Barbara is Suddenly Single After 50 and The Kitchen Bible. She worked formerly as a senior writer and researcher at Jewish Federation of St. Louis, where she helped launch and maintain an award-winning website. In 2019, she moved from her childhood home in St. Louis, Missouri, to New York City to live and write. <laughs> and now, if you would please help me in warmly welcoming our parents. <laughs> everybody and welcome. I'm Ellen Futterman. I'm the editor in chief of the St. Louis Jewish Body. And uh, for me tonight, especially, it's a little bit of a homecoming because I know Barbara for many years. We worked together at the St. Louis Post Dispatch. I know I was there for 25. How long were you there, Barbara? I was there eight years. Eight years, okay. So we crossed over for eight years. And then when I left I, and went to the light, I got to work with Meg um, because she was the senior writer and researcher at Federation. She really was a, tr and was a tremendous help to me with story ideas and so forth. So I feel like this is a great homecoming. I know a lot of you know both of them too from the time that they lived here in St. Louis. So we're gonna keep things fairly informal. I'm gonna start off by asking some questions and then I'm gonna turn it over to you and see if you have questions you'd like to ask them as well. So let's start with the obvious. How did you come up with the idea for the book? And let's talk about the title. 
when we finished Suddenly Single, I, I can't even remember if it was four or five years ago, we both had gone through a very difficult period, which is why we wrote the book. I had gotten divorced after 31 years of marriage. Meg had lost her husband, Nolan, after five years of illness. And we figured out how to craft new lives. And you know, we did it. We both entered back into polite society. We made new lives for ourselves. I ended up moving back east where I was from. And we thought, took a you know, big sigh of relief. We had new routines and friendships. And we decided oh, we're home free. Now we can just enjoy life. Nothing standing in our way. And then what happened was we both aged. I mean, that was the fortunate part. <laughs> but the difficult part was a way to accept. Yeah, we both hit 70, and it was a shock to both of us how many more challenges there were. And we're going to that uh, the challenges of friendships the challenges of dealing with grown children, which was a shock. You know, I think <laughs> the problems are only when they're little, and especially COVID, children telling us, you know, mom, you can't do that. You can't, you can't go to this store, you can't. And challenges of, we both had elderly mothers still at that point dealing with them. The challenges of where to live. I mean, I picked up literally and went back east where I hadn't lived for 31 years. So. That's, that's what led to the idea that there is another book for this new stage of life and the title meant, okay, so we're talking on the phone one day and Barbara brought two bones in your wrist. Okay. And she was complaining, it's not healing, it hurts. And she loves to play tennis and she's telling me, I just, I can't play tennis anymore. It's just, I said, Barbara, cool it, we're not dead yet. <laughs> she, said, she said, oh my God, that's the title of our new book. And we knew there was a new book in us. And we had so much wisdom in our <laughs> senior ages that we wanted to share it with everybody in a really optimistic way. Yes, and, and one way we wanted to share it, there's one friend who's here tonight who needed to go to the doctor and she wasn't sure what questions to ask the doctor oh, yeah. and I said here we are you know we we both have seen doctors where we think we're good at questions being reporters and we came up with a list and she took those questions to her doctor and the doctor said these are great questions <laughs> and, so, and she's so grateful that she allowed us to stay with her <laughs> well that does yeah, that dovetails kind of nicely into my next question, which is how did you decide which and what topics to include in the book and what to leave out or did you leave anything out? Well, we had the thought. Um, we, we just, we sort of approached it, what would we want to read about? What are the major concerns? And we thought about where we were go going to live if we didn't stay in our houses, which both of us did get out of our two large homes. We thought about downsizing at, as part of getting out of the homes. We thought about how to keep and make new friends as people were dying <laughs> and people were moving away. And some friendships, which is something we we'll get into friendship. About friendship. Um, what were some of the- Do we have enough money and, to live on? Um, will we out, you know, will we, have money at the end. We both had hoped to leave money to our children. Uh, those were the main, and also because of our parents, our elderly parents. That was but also how, how how would we continue to have purpose? Right. Would we work? Would we volunteer? You know, getting up every morning and knowing that we mattered. And I think both of us knew that we liked what we did. Maybe not every single assignment every day that we didn't want to give it up completely, but maybe at some point we would scale back so we had time for other interests or some new passions, which we and took up. biggie, how to deal with the new physical and emotional challenges. Because doctor on speed dial, and you know, there were cracks in the foundation. 
And we, and we kept hearing from more friends who were having more health problems. You know, every time we would joke that you'd go to lunch with somebody, a group of people, this person was having cataracts, this one was having me, this one was having him, this one was wanting to do cosmetic surgery, you know, on and on. And we joked that we weren't going to spend all of our time having these organ recitals. You know, we would, <laughs> we would, we would limit the gatherings. Of course, you know, we felt differently when friends had very serious illnesses, but just, um, it was more complaining. <laughs> a lot of complaining. But, and, and we still complain. Oh my God. Right. We complain. Look at your first during COVID. Um, but within the framework of the five concerns that we came up with, and I think they're pretty universal, we plugged in friendships and our grown kids and where we're going to live and how to downsize and what are some of the other things? Um, being healthier, right? Trying to be healthier, finding our passions, very important. Um, and where we wanted to end up with, not just where <laughs> we wanted to end up maybe next if there was an imminent move, but where the last move was going to be. We both had our mothers did very different situations, and there were pros and cons. So you know. Could we maybe have that hen house of a select group of friends together with a housekeeper rather than being in a nursing home? And our financial advisor told me, at least, who's here, who we both use, you know, try to make just one move. I mean, it's not just that it's expensive, but it's very disruptive. It's exhausting moving. And then the next step is the end of life stuff. Where are we going to live in perpetuity? And a lot of people haven't dealt with that. It's really hard. Nobody wants to deal with their mortality. I asked, I'm in a Zoom, I've been in a Zoom group during COVID like many people, and one of my Zoom groups that's still going on is 10 people from my K through 8 grade school. It was a co combined. And we weren't all like six women and four guys. We weren't all friendly growing up, but we came together and it's been great. And I asked the group at one time, you know, what are you doing about where you're going to live? And they all said, well, we're not old enough yet to be thinking about that. And that was recently. <laughs> so we have it all the time when we talk to people. Have you thought about where you're going to end? You know, spend your final years, the clock's ticking. Um, and most people haven't really dealt with it. They think they're too young. You know, Tom and Stephen. <laughs> you know, you, you, you talked a little bit about finding your passion. And I think that for many of us, as we consider retirement, you know, leaving something that we enjoy doing, because maybe we want to do other things, sometimes we get overwhelmed. There's so, like, there's so, maybe, maybe there's so many possibilities and, and maybe there are none. So, how do you find your passion? in retirement, you know, before it's too late? And how do you kind of keep from letting all the things that you may want to do overwhelm you so that you do nothing? You know, how, how, how do you continue to do Well, I mean, I still feel I work full time. It's not because of my own boss. I can. I'm a tough boss, though. So I don't take off lots of time. But if I, I can squeeze in some of my passions at different hours, for example, I went back about 10 years ago to painting, something I had done in college, and then circumstances led to me starting it again. So I take a class on Saturdays, sometimes a Friday, depending on my schedule. And so that's something I've made time for. It's sort of written in stone that that's what I'm going to do. Another passion of mine, I've always liked to cook. So, I continue to do that. Maybe not every day, but I have daughters who love to cook. So we were doing a lot of Zoom cooking and they were making their halas and their bagels. You know, we were comparing recipes. So I think it's really a matter of finding time. I exercise every single day. I, I take an exercise class or I try to do my 10,000 or 15,000 steps. You know, it doesn't always happen. So. I think, in some ways, this is a really special time 
we worked, we raised our kids, it's time to pay ourselves back. And we can do, at this point, pretty much anything we want to do, if we can make the time to do it. And passions can be anything from tracing your roots. I know people who have really gotten into that. Um, doing a consulting business. Uh, if you're musical, sharing your musical chops, teaching kids in a school, um, ramping up your, your cooking. Uh, I have a lot of friends who don't want to play tennis anymore, but are now into pickleball. I mean, that seems oh, to yeah, be- Oh yeah, pickleball's huge. That seems to be the rage. And then ones who gave up golf know. have gone back to golf or started it because during COVID, it was safe to play, to be that, you know, six feet away or whatever. Um, Develop a new talent, which Barbara has gone back to painting. I have started getting back into digital photography, which mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. in my job, and I love photography. Debbie knows. Um, and you know what? I know people who work so hard, they do nothing. Yeah, my brother was a doctor, and his day consists of doing his exercise, and sitting around. I mean, he's happy. I don't get it. I couldn't sit still. Um, me, uh, I was uh, on vacation a couple weeks ago, and, and I was in Santa Monica, California with my husband, and I was crossing the street, and I guess I saw the only piece of uneven pavement and took a, you know, my head down. So sad. And, right. And, and I've, I've had a few of those falls over time, and it, it scares me because I've been nervous. This was is this what the future holds? So um, so maybe you can talk about what tips you can offer for remaining optimistic, you know, when parts of us start not behaving the way we want, if our eyesight goes, our hearing goes, um, you know, our balance, we have to walk slower. Um, you know, and we don't want to, you know, we, we kind of don't want to get into that, but we acknowledge it. So is there a way to kind of stay positive through it? Or Well, I... I I work out with a trainer and we do a lot of balance work um, and also a lot with weights and specifically for these reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I said, I try to go to an exercise class once a day or walk a lot. So I'm trying to be much more mindful of practicing good health. Um, I'm spending more time definitely with doctors and spending more time, sadly, um, you know, going religiously to the dentist because I think it's so easy to start having problems mm -hmm. there. Um, I'm fortunate that I haven't had cataract surgery yet, but you know, I go to, I go to my regular doctors. I keep in touch. I have my schedule. I know when to see them. Um, I know that I have to do something about my hearing. My daughters are often saying, mom, you know, when I say, what, what? And Meg and I joke, we both sat through meals with people just nodding our head and saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> because we, I haven't heard half of the conversation. Right. It wasn't that noisy a restaurant. So <laughs> I know I need to do that. And I remember my mother, when she was losing her hearing, she would not do it because she said, my father's father got hearing aids. Now we're talking about probably, you know, 70 years ago, and they didn't work that well. So therefore, she was not going to do it, and she was not going to spend that money. She used to say a lot of times, I'm an old woman, it doesn't matter. Well, it did matter because she would sit at the dining room table with her granddaughters and then her grandsons, and she couldn't hear half the conversation. So I think it's really a matter of having that list of doctors and consciously doing something about it. And when you have a problem, acting on it rather than being terrified. And there are many ways to remain optimistic. Um, be grateful. You know, look, instead of waking up and complaining, look at the good things. Right? We have a lot to be grateful for. Um, it's, this is a tough stage. And, Maintaining a sense of humor is imperative. We, Barbara and I use a sense of humor all the time. Um, it's fun to laugh at ourselves. I mean, I have now started, this is ridiculous, 
carrying a magnifying glass into the grocery store because I can't see the ingredients. <laughs> or the flashlight that I am yeah, to see in the dark. Um, it's, you know, people are doing chair yoga and Pilates more and just, as you said, the fear of falling. Yeah. Yeah. That's a major thing. Yeah. I mean, this was my first coming out here this morning. This was my first plane flight, probably in Oh four, my God, four, you should have seen her on the four, plane. I think, <laughs> I, I, first of all, I hate to fly, but I do it. But, <laughs> so I always, get, I always get on board and I always ask the stewardess how, if the flight is going to be smooth. 80 people are getting on the plane <laughs> in the middle to the stewardess. What did you say? I asked if it was going to be a smooth plan. I said, could you please tell the pilot to make it smooth? I'm a nervous flyer. So I, it did get bumpy. And, you know, before it got bumpy, I was thinking, I have my, and here's one thing to be optimist. I have my list of 10 places that I want to go over the next 10 years or however long. Well, with the bumpiness, I decided I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm done with travel. All so right. all of a sudden, the trains and the subways and whatever seem so, really appealing. Right. And then the valley is sort of getting bumpy. And here we are, two old bags sitting next to this lovely young producer from Stephen Colbert, believe it or not, oh. who was sticking things in her ears so she didn't have to listen to us. And Barbara's called the stewardess over. Are you sure it's going to be smooth? Why is it bumpy? Are you sure? I mean, it was. Wait, wait, can't you just use science? And then she took science. Then she took it down. Then, then the pilot came out. To the oh, yeah. Then the she pilot took, came she out. Yeah. And, and I said to him, you're supposed to be in the cockpit. Oh, my <laughs> God. And, and he told me, he said, the plane flies on autopilot, which made me more nervous. <laughs> she told him to go back and do the. It was tough. I mean, fortunately for us, this is writing is a very solitary business, yeah. like certain other professions. And we've been very lucky. We wrote this book during the pandemic. We joke it was our pandemic baby. And we had a lot of fun writing it. Probably more fun than the last book, because the last. Part, yeah, we've had some very painful parts that we shared. And we get to laugh a lot together. We get to bounce ideas. So I think, you know, one thing to be optimistic is you have to have those really good friends or good acquaintances to keep in touch with, who check up, you know, and, and share with them. I'm having a lousy day. I'm depressed or whatever. Uh, or I'm having a great day. Right. Right. Well, it's, um, you know, the number that I am indicates that I am old, but I don't feel old. And I'm right. sure a lot of you out there are same thing. I mean, I've realized I've lived more of my life, you know, I have more behind me than I have ahead of me. But, I, you know, I don't, don't really feel old. But, I mean, is there a day that I'm going to wake up and go, boy, Ellen, you're old. Um, and you know, do you have any like age-defined tips that can help us to ward that off, or should we embrace it? I mean, what, how, how, you know, what scares you guys the most? Too, I, about I, I think we both have learned to live more in the moment. Um, I was always a planner, thinking ahead, and things don't always work out as you expected. And so we try to live more in the moment and enjoy. It doesn't mean we're not thinking ahead, but we're not focused perhaps as much. And we each have things we want to do. Meg does a lot of tutoring yeah. and connecting with kids, which is very energizing. And we both keep meeting people. I had a relative who said to me, a little bit older, and she said, well, you know, when you're past 70, you can't make new friends. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, I don't think that's true. You may not make the same kind of deep friendships that you had from childhood, college, or whatever, or when you first had children, but you can make friends. The thing that we found when Meg moved to New York, when I moved to my little town back east, is that 
you have to be a little more aggressive socially sometimes. You have to, if you want to have friends, you have to reach out. You have to be willing to be rejected. You, you ask the person for coffee, lunch, and you never hear from them. And as my mother used to say, the hell with them. You know, you sort of, you sort of move on. Yeah. There are so many ways to make friends. We are experts. We really <laughs> are. Um, I moved to a new city, and I did have a, my two sisters there and my son. My son, of course, has no time for me. Oh. Um, I talk to everyone on the street corner. Before COVID, it was really easy. And I talked to people in subways. And I got together with people I met in a cooking class. Um, I even met a guy in a cooking class. Um, it's just, you know, join things. I, I joined a temple. And I'm not religious, but I did it to have a community and so I could meet people. Um, I'm into women's groups. I just did a, I just joined a gardening thing. Do I know how to garden? <laughs> I wish Marsha were here now. <laughs> um, but I did it to meet people. I didn't do it to garden because I really it's gonna be sweaty and hot. Um, and in writing about friendships. That was probably one of the most um, enlightening parts of the book. We learned a lot more than we thought we knew. And this is a time of life where, you know, we don't have to continue toxic friendships. Get rid of a few, meet a few new people, and about the different levels of friendships. You have really close friends from childhood. You have your acquaintances. You have friends because maybe you enjoy talking about opera or music or um, something specific, painting. Uh, it, it was really, yeah. I think that was probably one of the biggest lessons we learned in writing this book. There were two very good books we read about friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, one is called Friendship by Lydia Denworth, and she writes a lot about the friendships that animals have with each other. And that was very helpful. And then a, a book called Big Friendship, which two women wrote, who talk about that, you know, sometimes with very close friendships, sometimes you even need to go to the equivalent of therapy if you have problems right. or um, how to deal with it. We have a very unusual relationship. We have written together for 35 years and we are very close. And that doesn't mean we didn't have a million, well, not a million, but several other close friends. But we know probably the best and the worst things about each other. And what keeps it tight is that we don't talk about what we say to each other to anybody else. And there's great trust and respect there. You no, know, we, we joke that when we have something to share that's secret and juicy oh, yeah. or whatever, we always say to the other, I always say, Meg, now you know you're not supposed to tell anyone, and she knows she's not supposed to tell, but we still preface all of our right. Because Barb is very superstitious. <laughs> she even brought her lucky bracelet today. <laughs> and we're also, we share friendships, that's one thing. We, so that's been fun. So I think, I think that's something that's really can keep you going. And not that you have to have a lot of friends, but you do need, Keep you so, going. Well, to, to, as you age, as you age, to, um, to, to, in your later years, because we saw that with our mothers also, their friendships so dwindled. I mean, I started sharing my friends with my mother, including my mother in my activities, because she needed to be around people. She needed to have conversations. It gets very lonely as you get older. Yeah. Well, it's shown friendships can prolong your life. I mean, if you're socially isolated, you're going to die earlier. And it's critical to good health, mental health, and physical health. Um, I'm going to turn this over to the audience. But before I do, I do want to ask you each, just was what was the biggest surprise for you in, when you were researching and writing? Like, what crystallized for you where it was either an aha moment or something that was super, that was totally unexpected in doing the work that you did to put the book together. 
Uh, for me, it was that I realized I do not want to be in a situation at the end of my life, hopefully there'll be a long life still, as my mother was in her own apartment in New York City, which was wonderful when she was mobile and could go out and walk up to the Metropolitan Museum, you know, 20 blocks away or do this or do that. But as time went on, it became very isolating and lonely. And she would call me up and say, I'm lonely. And I tried to have her with me every weekend. So that was a big surprise. And I do not want to be in that kind of situation when I'm not as physically fit. For me, what is the importance of planning? Estate planning, making sure you have all your ducks in order, your health proxy, you know what you have, you know what your investments are. If you're married, make sure that you talk about it. Um, when my husband died, I knew nothing and everything was done in a crisis and that is no way to do it. Um, we did, I didn't even know where he wanted to be buried or anything and Debbie knows because she lived through it with me. Um, and you didn't have his passwords. Oh, I had nothing, nothing. I mean, I was like a detective. I was, and it was right before tax season, which made it even worse. Um, the other thing is how to deal with adult children. We thought, you know, we were moving along. It was easy. We were independent. We could do what we wanted. It is so much harder to deal with adult children and when they're little, because they love you and they listen to you most of the time and they cuddle and them. <laughs> they're telling us what to do. <laughs> okay. All right, um, before I do this, I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that Robert and Megs, uh, they write a blog which runs yes. in the Jewish Life every Wednesday at stljewishlife.org. It is totally free and sign up on our website for our digital newsletters which come out every day on Wednesdays is Barbara and Meg Day so you can keep up with them and, and so on and uh, we invite you to do that. Questions? Well you didn't get around to sex and dating not necessarily in that order. Uh -huh. so oh, dish, please. <laughs> She's the expert on that. <laughs> I, had one, I had one relationship after two years after Nolan died which was very interesting. <laughs> so, you want to elaborate? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was What's fun. It wasn't fun. They all met him. So many people met him. It was, yeah, he was fun. He was smart. What do you say in the book about all that? Um, in, in which book? We have some experts. Read the book because we have some <laughs> experts talking about it. And okay. one of the things that one of the experts says is women tend to always go back to the same kind of person. And then we wonder why we can't meet somebody decent. So, um, what about you, Barbara? I know well, I thought in my yes. last book, I chronicled my extensive <laughs> online dating, <laughs> which I kept a spreadsheet. Did you mix people up? I did. I mixed yeah. some of the people up. <laughs> yeah. Part of that, I think it's very different getting divorced or yeah. dumped, as I would say, than losing a spouse. So I dated a lot, and some of it was fun, some of it was not. And then about nine and a half years ago, out of the blue, a longtime friend fixed me up with a college friend of his. So it was my first fix-up since I was divorced. And we're it together. Took. It took. It took. He's we're great. Together. And so that's it for me. Well, I did three internet dates because my daughter signed me up. And <laughs> the, one was worse than the other. <laughs> the worst was the third one. Who I couldn't tell the picture had a yarmulke on. And then <laughs> he shows up with his shirt buttoned down to here with hair sticking out. And I thought, if I see anybody here, I will die. Close watch. And I'm sitting there, and of course, I saw two people I knew. And I was just, oh, I was just interviewing him first. <laughs> but I will say, it's, you know, it's, I think it's dating 
later on. I don't know how many people want to sh share their story. It's very different than yes. when you're in college or very young. I think because, you know, it doesn't mean that people young don't have wonderful luck and long-term relationships, but by this time I knew definitely more of what I wanted. I knew who I was better than I was when I was 22 and got married. And I knew what I was willing <coughs> to put up with and not. I'm glad you knew. <laughs> I did the opposite. <laughs> I had a terrific husband and then boom. But it was fun. Dating was interesting. Yes, Norman. <laughs> I'd like to know, have you described your uh, collaboration? How do you do it? Do you? Pick That's a good question. Do you okay. pick different subjects or do you work together on everything or just what do you do? And, well, we, and you live in different places too. Yeah. So we, yeah. um, That's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, we each write for other publications where we don't write together. Sometimes we'll bounce some of those ideas off. But when, whether it's a blog or a new book we're starting, we talk about it and when it's a, was a chapter in a book or a blog, one of us starts it and then sends it to the other one. So it goes back and forth through a lot of um, yes. changes. Yeah. And and then there's a point at which we say, okay, we're done. And in, in doing the book, Barbara is the organized one and she divvies up the chapters and she's bossy and she'll say, hey, you can do this and this and this, and I'm doing this and this and this. And then we, you know, pass them back to each other, and it's a really I mean, seamless it's, process. Yeah, it's a well-oiled machine at this point. I mean, I think that I don't think we could tell, or people, other people could tell, who wrote what. And there are times where I'll suggest a blog topic, and Meg said, you know, I don't. That's boring, or we've done that, or something, whatever. It's also how much work one of us has if we have time. Um, you know, Barbara could be very involved in something, uh, one of her big stories, and she'll say, we need some blogs. And I'll come, you know, whip up a few, and then she'll work, she'll fine tune them. So we go back and forth. And no hurt feelings, we're very honest with each other, and it works. You know, we've said, you know, we've never we've really said had it's boring, <laughs> or it needs to be lighter. I mean, I think we're good at editing each other. Why don't we argue? <laughs> um, because I, I just think we're both of us are conflict reverse, we adverse, we just it's just not an interest. We respect each other. But we also say it on right in the moment. You will say, Meg, that hurt my feelings. Why did you say that? Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And vice versa. So it's honesty and respect. It's like any good marriage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we did have a lot of, we've had people at different stages say, are you still getting along? That's Which, nice. you know, I'm sort of surprised. I don't know if they'd ask that of two men working together. I'm not so sure. Um, but, well, I will say this, the friendship has really enriched my life. Me too. Yeah. And if anything happens to her, I don't want them to do. No, <laughs> one of you can take over. No, we, um, you know, I think it's gotten better. And especially during, as I say, during COVID, it was a very lonely time for a lot of people. And I mean, I felt for Meg who had moved to New York and then boom, oh, that was you know, fun. things, she couldn't go out to different activities as much. So, and she was in an apartment, which and the I, think has, much, I think it's much harder than I was in a house with a garden, which I think made. And you have a car. And I have a car. Mm -hmm. I have yeah, a car. I was really stuck. Lynn knows. Yeah. So I, I actually, when you speak me now, I had a question related to it. So do you think, has, has anything changed in your relationship since you're geographically closer to each other these last two years? Or not really? No, no, because we we, you know, we've been in the same city. The first book we started, we wrote in Meg's basement. Yeah. We've been in the same city. We've been in different cities. Um, we talk constantly yeah. but and about everything. It doesn't necessarily have to be about work. Yeah, yeah. you know, books and 
I watched far too much TV <laughs> during COVID. We, you know, talked, shared series, Barbara made bagels. Oh my God. You're not the holla. Yeah. <laughs> we had a grill. We both entered. Oh. I wanted to enter the Wisconsin grilled cheese contest. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was convinced mine was going to win. <laughs> Not, but Meg also entered it, so it became a yes. little competition between the two of us. <laughs> We've entered it twice. We entered twice. We, pick, pick ours. we made great <laughs> sandwiches. <laughs> they were very creative. So, other questions? I think we maybe have time for one more. Is there anything that we, I haven't answered, but the audience has it that you feel like might be something? For us to take away in terms of well, I think, a piece of wisdom. Okay, ladies. I think I think for the really later years, the good news is there are more options available. There's co-housing communities where people live together and share responsibilities. Uh, and there's some that are almost equivalent of a nice nursing home. So I think to explore those options. Uh, it's very expensive bringing in a health care aid into your home. And I think it's important to, to think about where you want to be. Well, most people want to age in place. I mean, what are, what are the statistics? It's really high. 70 or 90 percent right. of the people at the ask say, I want to age in place. So it's, it's hard to do. Did you look at any of the communities that, like, Margarita Villas and those kind of things, or communities of, of yeah. you know, for older folks? Mm -hmm. And is that a good way to go for a lot of I think it's right if you can find the one that fits you. Because yeah. there are so many. I talked to some woman today who lives in a 55 plus community in Florida, which she said a real estate person suggested. And she said, oh, we're not old. We're not looking bad. And then they looked at a million places, and then they said, show us the 55 plus, and that's where they moved. And they love it. You know, what, what are those called? Continu no. Conti well, continuing well, some care. are continuing care, where you live in independent, and then if you get worse, assisted living, and then whatever the nursing home's called. But the, uh, just throw out one number, which is shocking. When I did look, when my mother was reaching a point oh, yeah. where, uh, she needed somebody to come in and more than I could do. Um, and she had given up her long-term care oh, no. without uh, without consulting anyone. This is something she decided. Uh, insurance, the long-term long -term care insurance. Uh, I This was New York City, so granted it's one of the most expensive markets in the country. To have a 24-7 aid from an agency who had been all checked out, come in would have been two hundred and fifty thousand a year. Whoa. I mean, that's a lot of money for most people. So, yeah. Yeah. yes. What's the follow-up? <laughs> oh, Still not dead yet. Almost dead. <laughs> there might be a single. One foot in the grave. <laughs> We're working on a couple things actually right now. Right. Yeah, can you talk about some? Yeah, we're, that's up to you. We're working on another. We did a kitchen book five years ago, and they it sold out, and they asked us to do another version, which will reflect some of the same trends in that book, but also kitchens have changed partly because of all the time spent during COVID, but also because of other things. Um, so that book is in the works now. And we're completing our first children's book. Oh, no, we didn't hear from that woman. Yeah. So that's fun. And there'll probably be something else along the lines of that book when it's we're a little too close to it. We need us for that. We need a little time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be we'll go. Huh? <laughs> That's a big fear of aging, dementia, the falling that you mentioned, um, you know, yeah. those kinds of issues. Yeah. It's scary. Well, let's, let's end on a positive note. Yes. So, yes. so give us a little something we can take with us to feel good about as we get older. Uh, I feel very, very blessed. I think that's the best thing. I have a roof over my head. I have fewer needs 
fewer things I really, I really don't need anything. The roof, the food, the good medical care, my kids happy, and my friends, and that's it. I mean, you know, the trips are maybe, that'd be nice, but it's not important, really. Matt, you? I lost my thought. <laughs> <laughs> I am always. Well, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I think uh, Megan and Barbara are happy to sign books. Have I corrected that? <laughs>